So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Connor Hackling, who's the news director for WRBL, and Chuck Williams, who is probably the, has the highest level of credibility of journalists in this region, but don't tell him I said that because it might just go to his head. Uh, these two have been so pivotal in helping us fine tune our practicum, the TV practicum that you see on the course schedule every, every semester. They've worked very closely with us to translate our learning outcomes. Don't glaze over on this. But, you know, those are those things on your syllabus that says at the end of the semester, students will be able to blah, 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 blah. blah. Well, we wanted to hear what WRBL was hiring for. We talked with uh, Joe McGuire, the, the, uh, the WRBL uh, man, uh, general manager. Oh, general manager. I was going to let He's you go. Like, for a while. Yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to help. Uh, who has been here for almost every one of these presentations? I just heard this man sit for the situation in, just on the phone that he probably could have very well filled his day checking out, but yet he's here with us. This speaks volumes. We're so grateful. But we work with them closely to get what is it that you want in the next hires. And we translated that into student learning outcomes. And so we're training you in their standard. Uh, I think every one of our students who've come through the practicum has been offered a, an internship opportunity. And then we can almost guarantee that you're at least going to get your foot in the door for an interview. Now, it's up to you to hold your own on that. But we've had a really good track record in that area. So this relationship expands our capacities beyond what we even dreamed possible five years ago. It gives you exposure. It gives you portfolio building opportunities. And we're just thrilled. Not surprised that you would support it the way you have this very first venture with our, set, uh, our series but we're grateful. So Connor and Chuck, I think you all are today talking about politics, not that uh, that's ever an interesting subject, right? <laughs> yeah, we are. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having us, Dr. Gibson. Uh, I am Connor Hackley. I'm the news director here, and uh, I have Chuck listed as a reporter, but he really is uh, the political ex expert of the Chattahoochee Valley. Um, so I'll let uh, him do some of the talking about halfway through this presentation, because he really does have the interesting stuff to say. He'll talk about his experiences uh, not only this political season, but since you started covering politics 30 years ago, however long that was. So, and I think the climates back then are completely different than they are uh, today. Uh, before we jump into this, I do want to just touch on what Dr. Gibson just said about opportunities at WRBL. Um, Joe and I were actually just talking about an hour ago about um, some open positions that we've had and filling those positions. And media companies across the country are having an issue uh, hiring open positions. Uh, we haven't really seen a problem at WRBL. Part of that because of uh, CSU's program and the work between the practicum and the internships. Uh, we've hired, I think, five full-time CSU students in the past five years, or excuse me, two years, and then the, with the internships, we've had probably more than two dozen CSU interns. Um, and we certainly will give you an opportunity to come work for us, whether that be a part-time a position or full-time, uh, you will get uh, your foot in the door and you will have an opportunity uh, to, to have a career out of college. We have some folks that are actually working while they finish up uh, their degrees. Uh, we have uh, Gabby Dixon as our full-time morning producer and she's still got a semester left here at CSU. So there's certainly opportunities there. Um, and I, I'll give you all my contact information at the end of this and feel free to, to reach out with anything. Uh, today we will talk uh, politics, and if you guys were at Chuck or, or mine uh, last presentation, this one will be a little bit shorter, um, but I think this is probably the more, most interesting thing we can talk about this year in this political climate. Um, so we'll start off with, there's a quick little two minute video here from I believe the University of Oregon, um, talking about ways that the media uh, can influence a political uh, election cycle. Yeah. 
way the candidate chooses to. This is all happening so quickly. Uh, campaigns are these great laboratory experiments in a way where the, the campaigns use whatever resources and knowledge they have to sometimes try new things as well as the, the tried and true methods of, of influencing voters. But one of the things that's happening this time around is that social media are so much more central to the candidates' um, campaigns, to, to their efforts to reach voters. When Hillary Clinton's logo first came out about 15 months ago, there was a lot of initial reaction from myself included that it was perhaps very different than we were expecting and perhaps maybe even not successful. But what we've now come to realize is the way that her logo was developed, it works extremely well in a social media context. Another interesting example, when Donald Trump announced his running mate, Mike Pence, uh, his campaign initially put forth a logo that was mocked heavily, heavily, heavily on social media. It was immediately taken down. Because of the positive rights, we get Clayton more showing us now. The latest on the convention bus, we are saying, Lance, over this logo, what we'll going on with this? Oh, well, so it was kind of amazing because what you actually had was the logo rolled out. And this was the first time I think social media totally drove this thing into the ground. We can no longer use one single source or platform or tool to be able to find and verify stories. That's probably the biggest way in which social media is really changing the way that we journalists work around election cycles. That we just now have access to so many more potential sources and stories, um, both in our own geographic area across the whole of the states. So that gives us an opportunity to find stories that perhaps we might have missed before or would have struggled to find previously. So these are fantastic tools and resources that they've enabled us to access more stories and people and ideas than ever before. But you have to bring uh, strong journalistic sensibilities to these tools to get the most out. So that video obviously is from the 2016 election, but that was intentional in choosing that uh, kind of strategy because that's one of the starts of when social media started jumping into this election cycle. Obviously, social media has been a part of the election cycle for a while now, but 2016 really changed the game and influenced the way 2020 went, and it's going to influence the way elections go uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so we can go ahead and go on to the next. So, uh, ways that we can influence politics. I, I don't think a lot of people that work in media realize some of the, the gatekeeper power they have when uh, talking about elections. Um, it's a very, very, very real responsibility and journalists uh, need to take that seriously. And if we don't, um, it, it can absolutely ruin our reputation, but it, it can cause more than reputational harm. It can affect an entire community if someone were to drive away somebody thinks in an irresponsible way. So we take this, this very seriously and it's one of the most important things as far as accuracy and influence that we will ever cover in our entire lives as journalists. Um, so a couple of things. So to cover or not to cover. This was something I, I thought I found interesting and I went back and reflected on if this was true with WRBL um, and, and other media organizations locally and nationally. Um, if this was kind of the way of thinking. And the, the thing I thought was interesting was as hard as it is to believe, the biggest thing that drives elections is simple name recognition. So that may be obviously the voter. Do you know that, that person's name? But for the media side, if we have a bigger name, are we covering that person more just because of their name brand? That's something that you, you really have to think about. And if you go back and you think, well, we have this candidate that everyone knows because name recognition, we're going out and we're doing stories on them because of X, Y, and Z drama, whether it be you know, in local news or national news, um, that's not how we should be covering politics. Um, bias and scripts. This is more something we, we see on the national level and we, we do our best to avoid it on local news outlets, but political information can be found. You don't need to watch WRBL necessarily or Fox News to figure out a way uh, a candidate stands on something. Obviously, we will cover that, but you could simply go to Google and figure out a way or there are candidates social media that we just talked about, figure out a way a candidate thinks on an issue. So what's happening is national media, more national media outlets are shifting towards giving opinions and, and taking one side. Um, viewers are more attracted to that on the national side because it may align what they agree with. Again, that's a national media standard. Local news, we don't take that. We don't put our opinions in, in, a, in a coverage over uh, a certain election or a certain political party. Uh, pictures obviously can, can speak a thousand words. This actually I wanted to 
show this specific example, because we're not even perfect in local media. We were doing an article about our next star debate that uh, we are doing on October 14th, the only debate between uh, U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and challenger Herschel Walker. Uh, we were doing an article about the debate criteria, and we were so focused on the debate criteria, making sure we had everything right, uh, that we had everything ready to go, and we had a social media, our social media team go in and say, uh, search Warnock Walker for our archive of pictures we have of them, put that as a featured image. Well, we hit publish, and what's wrong with this picture? There's a headline that says, debate criteria released for next star debate. Looks like somebody's happy about it, and looks like the other person's not happy about it. So that was something that we immediately realized, and we said, okay, we need to replace that image. But that, it, it, can, it's, it can happen to anyone. National media, obviously, they may have their way they want to. Maybe uh, one organization puts that picture out intentionally. Locally, we would not want to do that. And we got a on Twitter for that. Yep. So that, that's stuff that yeah, we, 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 we look at that stuff. We ask the public to keep us in check. That's part of our, our responsibility and our, our promise to the viewer. Uh, we're not going to be perfect every single time. There's gonna, obviously, I can tell you this was not intentional. I promise you that. I, all, everyone on our team uh, was not going to purposely put up a photo of Walker, or excuse me, uh, Warnock, not happy about the debate rules or for what it seemed like. Um, social media bias, uh, we talked about it, a little, or they talked about it a little bit at the University of Oregon. But as far as our journalists, journalists locally, we are very, very careful uh, with what we post online on our social media profiles. Um, we actually had a company-wide call yesterday um, about some of the way we handle standards within, within our company and younger journalists. And the thing that got the most attention was social media. Uh, news directors from across the country were asking questions about how young journalists can handle their social media and how, how they should. And I think a lot of younger journalists say, you know, or they think, I've got my Twitter. It has nothing to do with WRBL in it. I, I don't have a shirt that says WRBL in it. Obviously, I work for WRBL, and I put something in my Twitter that says retweets or likes are not necessarily endorsements of a political stance or candidate. That's not good enough anymore. Um, we do not allow uh, our, our journalists to retweet, or unbalanced retweet, I should say, a certain side of an issue. If you are covering, and Chuck can probably talk about more about this, if you're covering an issue and a candidate says something pertaining to that issue, Yes, that may be a time to retweet it, but it's, it's all of an imbalanced thing. I can tell you it's very easy most of the time to go on a journalist website that works in a national organization, and I'm, you just don't tell me who they work for. If they're a political reporter and they work for a national organization, within 10 tweets, you'll be able to figure out exactly which way they lean on a certain issue. Um, so again, locally, we try to avoid that. Um, with that, I want to bring Chuck up here a little bit to talk about um, kind of how uh, political coverage has changed in the last, what, 150 years you've been doing this, and, and, and kind of how, uh, how, how we deal with it now locally. You know, it's interesting because you look there, I mean, as you can see, that's a, you know, that's a leader eight months, and then and both those interviews have been fairly recent. I think that was April, that was in the late August. Um, address matter for that. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because what Connor's talking about in Twitter part is really where the politics came to be played out. And I've been on Twitter since 2008. I got on it at the Alabama Clemson uh, football game in Georgia. And everybody was getting on. I created an account and started my Twitter. And Twitter is a long haul game. I probably got I'm about to get 2,500 followers, and they're all naturalized and bought everybody. I mean, I just it's oh, been organic through what I've covered. But politics is is being played, George, particularly Georgia state politics, on Twitter. All the AJC people that are probably covering the races closer than anybody, Greg Bluestein, Patricia Murphy. Uh, these AJC reporters are just nailing it. They're doing a lot of their stuff on Twitter. They put the jolt on there. Raul Bali, a Georgia public broadcasting uh, reporter, is putting all of his stuff out there. He's out there a good bit. Stephen Fowler is out there. He's another GPB reporter. And you can find these guys that are really doing this stuff. And I retweet a lot of their stuff. Uh, I tweet a lot of my own stuff. I put a couple things from Governor Kemp's stuff out there yesterday, but can you pull that picture up that it showed you? 
I'm going to show you what can happen on Twitter. You might remember this. That was a tweet. That photo was in a tweet. Uh, and when you look at that, this was just as we were coming out of COVID. That tweet, first of all, her social media team changed the next day. Um, there, were, there were changes on the staff, but that tweet was used to attack. She later apologized for it. She issued a public apology, for, uh, Leader Abrams issued a public apology for that. That's what can happen on Twitter. That is a prime example. That's probably the biggest faux pas any of the candidates have made so far, and I'm sure there are others, but that one, that one's in a league of its own, really. And, you know, and what that University of Oregon report was saying was that candidates can use Twitter and social media, but Twitter specifically, to get their message out. They can. That's, that is proof of it. That's not the message they wanted to see. You know, and the thing about, you know, what Connor was saying just a minute ago about our policies, I probably play closer to the line on what I do Twitter-wise than anything else I do. Because I do tweet out stuff that can be seen as one side or the other. I do sometimes report things that people may say, well, that's bias. But it's stuff that, it's usually stuff people had said or a direct interpretation and not opinion of what I've heard or, or seen politicians say. You know, and you will see a lot more of the Twitter stuff as we get closer to the election. I mean, twi I mean, all the candidates are using it. Walker's using it. I mean, I mean, here's a prime example. This debate that WRB, that Nexstar, WSAV, WRBL, WJBF will be hosting on uh, October the 14th in Savannah, 7 p.m. It's going to be my CTV. I'm telling you right now, go ahead and put it on your calendars, that it's the only debate that Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock are going to do. It is going to draw national, sometimes even international, attention. It, if you're going to watch one political event this whole cycle, you should be in front of your TV watching that debate. It will inform you as a voter, and I think it's just going to be really interesting. But Herschel, Reverend Warnock agreed to three debates right out of the bat. As soon as the primaries were over, and what Herschel Walker had been saying in the Republican primary, I'll debate him anywhere, anytime. So Warnock agrees to debates in Savannah, Macon, and Atlanta, all fairly traditional Georgia debates. Walker goes weeks and doesn't agree to any debate. Then there was a next star proposal that had been sent to both of them early in the cycle. It resurfaced again. Uh, Walker's camp ends up taking the next star debate in Savannah. Totally different from the other debate in Savannah. And then that plays out. But Senator Warnock and Walker are both using Twitter to go after each other on these debates. I mean, Joe has seen the tweets. You know, you know, Warnock is saying, hey, you need to do more than one debate. You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Warnock is very focused message-wise that there need to be multiple debates. Walker has committed to a debate. He is, debate, he is not committing to any more. It looks like right now he already has it, is the best way to say that. Um, and, you know, Walker announced that, hey, on see you on October 14th in Savannah, I'm gonna be there. You know, it's they're both using Twitter to set the stage for this crazy debate that we're all about to get into. It's gonna be, it's gonna, it, I'm telling you right now, you need to watch it. Everybody in the state of Georgia needs to watch this. Well, the other thing too, um, when, when we got confirmation that the debate would happen from Senator Warnock, didn't you put it out on Twitter? Yeah. And then immediately some of the political reporters around the state started calling Chuck. So that's how they almost communicate with each other, which I thought was interesting. Well, I mean, 
reporters who cover this will talk to each other. And, you know, and a lot of that is, you know, I'm not at every event. I mean, I'm at events that some of the Atlanta reporters are not at. You know, and they're just calling, the, you know, and, but they're also looking at your tweets. They're looking at, I mean, I tweeted out a soundbite about a reporter yesterday in a scrum with Governor Kemp at the Kia plant asked, can Herschel Walker win? Pretty quick question. And Governor Kemp was yes. And then he explained, started talking about it. A 50 second sound bite that I pulled off of my phone and I tweeted it out this morning. It's like, here's what, here's what the governor had to say when asked if Herschel could win. And that's stuff that will get interstate wide. I mean, you know, when Senator Warnock was in Columbus for the uh, rally that he did in, uh, a month ago, um, and he came in. He came in here, did the rally, and uh, Hannah James, one of our reporters, talented, talented young reporter, she videotaped the whole um, Warnock stunt speech, 27, 28 minutes of it, and. You know, and I, I started looking in our video s stuff, and I didn't realize she had cut it as a complete deal. I was like, whoa, that's pretty good. And so I grabbed it out of the video thing, created a story, put the story online, and then I immediately tweeted it out. And I know a number of people went to our place to see a whole 28-minute Warnock stump speech. You know, and you know, so that's how social media changes. That's something we wouldn't have never done on air. You'd never see a full 20, I mean, we're not gonna cut in for a 28 minute U.S. Senate stump speech, but you can get the whole thing right there on, on the Twitter. Yeah, so Chuck's not lying. This is gonna be a huge, huge debate. So that's WRBL, seven o'clock Eastern, uh, uh, Friday, October 14th. And then we will have a post-debate show starting at eight o'clock, which Chuck will be directly involved in as uh, one of the panelists on that. So. Uh, we're gearing up for it. Um, we also have another debate that um, will be uh, directly involved y'all at uh, CSU. Uh, for those who don't know, we did a mayor mayoral debate in April, I believe it was April 28th, um, at University Hall between Skip Henderson, incumbent Skip Henderson and John Anker. Um, we spent a lot of time preparing for that debate. I believe we had a total of 27 questions, which we knew we would not get through all of those questions, but. We spent a lot of time, I, th I think we got nearly to 20 of them. So we spent a lot of time formulating those and making sure they were fair questions. We have a whole team doing it for the U.S. Senate debate. And it's, uh, trust me, it's a long process and there are some long meetings that have been leading up to it. are a tightly held deal because those questions have become <laughs> a point of contention in this debate because Senator Warnock has asserted that Walker wanted to do this debate because he's going to get the questions ahead of time. Not accurate. What Walker and Warnock will get is topics that they wanted. I don't know where that all stands now, but they will get topics just like they do in the presidential debate, debate crime, just general topics, you know, women's reproductive rights, things that you know are coming out there, but, you know, just, okay, we're, you're going to get some questions on this, you know, your personal life. You know, and they're not going to get the the direct question, and you know, but it, but people because of social media, in a large part because that's where it's played out. You know, I had somebody ask me the other day, "Well, y'all are giving them the questions, aren't you?" And I was like, "No, no, 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 we're not." And that was a journalist. I mean, so there's misinformation out there on that, and you know, and questions are, I mean. Questions are going. This going to be. What am I trying to say? It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a lot of drama. <laughs> now, think about it. If you gave somebody a question, all we're doing now is rehearsing basically a theater type production where people can study for as long as they want and script an entire debate. That's not what a debate is. Topics, yes, like Chuck said, presidential candidates get the topics all the time ahead of time by networks, whoever is hosting that debate. Um, but you know, we would not give uh, candidates a question. Uh, Neither would we would in this debate. With uh, on the left is Chris West. There, he is the Republican challenger to Congressman Sanford Bishop. So, if, if any of y'all have been living here for a while, you probably know uh, or heard of Congressman Bishop. He's been a long time. How many years has he been in office? Thirty, 30 years. 
Um, for those that are a lot smarter than us and political experts, uh, they say that Chris West is uh, one of the first challengers in a long time to really have a shot uh, in this election. Um, so we are doing a debate again. This will be August, or excuse me, October 26 at seven o'clock um, at CSU's University Hall. We are working on uh, an app on our website that will allow students to download tickets and we will cap the number of tickets. So um, those who are interested, um, we will send out a release as soon as that is, is formulated um, and there's a way to get those tickets. Um, but for y'all especially, um, we could use help on this. Um, we want anybody that has any political background uh, to help us with, on, uh, with us on that night or especially technical background I can tell you in the mayoral's debate, we uh, set up, we had the theater for two days and we were doing a lot of the setup at the last minute on the day of the debate. Um, so we could use anybody that has any experience or wants to help with that. Please reach out to me. I think my contact's actually on the, the next uh, um, slide here. You can email me or that's my office number. Um, additionally, on election night uh, in November, we will bring in some folks or we want to bring in some folks from CSU to help us on election night. Uh, I can tell you we've done this in the past with interns. November the 8th. November 8th, Tuesday, November the 8th. It'll be an all-night thing. And then the runoff, yep, we're probably gonna have a runoff as well. It'll be, it'll be an all-night thing. We will feed you, we'll have food, but it is one of the coolest things you'll ever be able to experience. I can tell you there's nothing like working on election night as a student in college. I, I did it at Georgia Southern University um, at a station down there and could not believe what, what all the production was that went into it, all the preparation that you guys don't necessarily get to see, but we'll, we'll see on the night of, of how it all is planned out. Um, and it's invaluable experience on that. So please, please reach out to me on that. We will be, we'll put you to work on that night too. It's not gonna be getting people coffee. We'll have you directly involved with uh, some of the, the production and live production of, of this election night. I also have here, uh, before we get off politics, and we'll answer questions on politics, a producer position opening. We started a 5.30 p.m. newscast at WRBL. Um, we, uh, we had a five, we had a six, but we did not have a newscast at 5.30. Um, so I'm looking to hire a producer for that uh, position. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to me. Email or phone is, is fine on that. Currently I'm producing that newscast. Um, this would be a producer, someone that has a good news, news judgment, but really wants to take something on their own, a project of their own and control it and be a leader and has a good writing ability. I think if you can do those things and you have a willingness to learn how to be a better writer, you can be a producer at WRBL. Um, we just hired one, as I mentioned, Gabby, that has taken over our morning uh, show. And uh, I've been talking to the morning team and others around, and she's doing a fantastic job. And she has all those qualities I just talked about. So if that sounds like you, please, please let me know. I'm looking to hire that now. The position is open. I can direct you to how to apply um, on our Nextstar website if you reach out to me. Um, and if you have any other questions, please, please just email me uh, or call me uh, at that number. Um, any other questions for me or Chuck? Chuck can probably answer any political stuff better than I can. I just want to say one thing. If you take a TV internship, chances are you get to follow this man into potential courtroom situations, covering news stories. You get to work shoulder to shoulder with him. Um, it's quite it's an opportunity. It's quite <laughs> well, our students say that it opened their eyes. They felt the intimidation of being in a courtroom situation and things that normally you may or may not read in a textbook for how to do or how not to do, they actually saw it lived out and they felt that they had never had a better mentor to have right there at their side. So uh, from the general manager, the news director, and this amazing uh, journalist who started on traditional print media and has made that transition into social media. Um, I'm a pretty traditional guy. <laughs> <laughs> Our Matthew Tessier, who works I think with social media marketing now, he started out, very first thing, got a call from me because we had a student who was going to help with a political uh, debate would this have been 2016 maybe? I can't remember. And they got sick and so we needed somebody to fill in and Matthew stepped up to the plate and was one of the students asking questions and he got bitten by the media bug 
and has never uh, really let it go. He loved it. So there's so many opportunities. When Joe showed up, when Joe showed up at WRBL as our general manager in January, I missed the announcement meeting. I was out covering something, and I think I was in court. And because what about the newsroom? Said, so you're my newspaper guy. Oh. <laughs> and, and I was like, that's either really good or really bad. But you know what you said, in, in Dr. Gibson, in, in your introduction was interesting to me. You talked about my cred credibility, and I appreciate that because of everything I've got, credibility is the most important thing. But in this, in any story, but in political stories, you can damage or ruin that credibility in a, it's as quick as, it, in a snap of a finger, you can ruin 30 years of credibility if you do something stupid. And for I'm the whole station. For the whole, right. oh yeah, not just me. I mean, the, I mean, you know, you know, we're watching some of the weather coverage out of Florida this morning. There's a station down there that's got some credibility issues right now based on something a reporter said that wasn't a meteorologist on the air during the coverage. I mean, you know, it, it just, you know, and I wasn't trained to talk into a lot of mic. That's a totally foreign thing to me. It, you know, Connor, David Hart, who was Joe's predecessor, and, and Joe have all been very, very good about saying, okay, just anytime you're standing there and that mic's around, just assume it's on. And, you know, it's very similar to what an editor used to tell me years ago. He said, don't say it if you don't want to see it on a billboard on Veterans Parkway. And that, I mean, it's, but it's a little more real-time version of that. And y'all, and take advantage of what Connor's offering. He's offering. One other thing, I, and I'm talking about our position at WRBL. And at Nexstar, who's running the debate, our parent company, has 200 TV stations across the country. So if there isn't a position at WRBL, but you have the skill set you believe to work in this industry, reach out to me because I have news directors chains and they jump on candidates like that. Within two minutes, someone will email me back saying dibs. That's literally how they do it. They call dibs on, on these candidates and calling them first. So it's a very competitive uh, market out there for news directors. So we'd love to get you within our company. I'll say the only thing I'm going to tell you, I, I, I tell a lot of the young journalists in our building, and I should tell all of them about social media. I talked to Connor somewhere between often and regularly about social media because I, I think it can be very beneficial, very beneficial, but I also think it can be very destructive for a whole host of reasons. And I'll, I'll tell a lot of the young journalists, you can be a journalist or a social media influencer. You get a choice, but you can't be both. And so if you're getting into journalism, consider you need to be a journalist because you put the reputation of a news organization on your shoulders when you're whether you're on camera, off camera, social media, whatever. But you, you can be a journalist, but understand that restricts you, you from doing a lot of this other social media stuff that a lot of people do that I hate. I can't stand it. But I think it can be very useful for news. Chuck does it very well. Chuck talks about news and he also talks about sports a lot. And he, he interacts that way and, and builds his brand up that way. So there's a lot of benefits to it. But one click of a retweet, even if you don't mean anything by it, can destroy the brand of the news organization. So I, I watch our stuff, just not only our new social media platforms, but the people who work in the building. I look at their stuff and make sure there's nothing inappropriate. Not just the news people, our sales people. Any, any, any employee of WRBL represents the news organization in my mind. Um, so I just wanted to... You know, that. But one of the things you have to do on Twitter is you have to be a little... I mean, people have to sort of see a little bit. Like this morning, I posted my Peloton workout numbers on Twitter this morning. It was a, it was a hard morning on Peloton. But, you know, and that's the way you can get some people to relate to you. And, you, you know, people will bounce back. Sometimes if I'm grilling vegetables or something, I'll post that. Just to do something a little different. I pulled away from Facebook. More. I, I don't do near as much Facebook. And most of what I do with Facebook gets a lot of likes, but it's usually very personal stuff. Thanks for having us today, guys. Again, any other questions, please don't hesitate to call me or email me, um, whether that be internship, practicum, full-time, part-time, debate help, election night help. Uh, we can find a spot for you, certainly. Thank you all. And we've had um, an anonymous donor 
is also contributing money uh, to the Friends of Communication account and it's an honor of you all speaking today. So uh, Connor and Chuck, you double, you caught us in double digits, so thank you so much. Uh, hey, just, just if you ever on a game That's show and this question comes out, who invented the podcast format for a final at Columbus State University? That would be Chuck Williams. Uh, remember our students in the internship yeah. in the uh, practicum? Yeah. You let them go on air with your podcast Thank and you. you interviewed them and they were able to demonstrate the proficiencies and what they had learned. And of course, I sat there weeping at times and laughing at times. So this team is so creative in that you're all toward serving the community doing the jobs professionally, also they have that mentor part, so thank you. And last night I was getting ready to go on air to do the government camp story and I just come in from West Point and I look up and Connor has hired Brian Thompson who was one of my first practicum kids and, Brian, and I look up and Brian's just sitting there smiling at me I'm like, hey man, good to see you, I'm glad you're back. So, so the, the kid, they're, they're, bouncing, they're bouncing back and that's a good thing for us and for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.